But the only correlation we find right now is that as we eat less red meat as humans, we become less healthy. On this week's podcast, I wanted to attack head on a notion that I've seen growing in the social media space, which is the fact that you can't eat red meat and live a long time. <clears throat> Bullshit. Um, in this podcast, I will discuss the unique nutrients found in red meat, including taurine, anserine, carnitine, carnosine, B12, 4-hydroxyproline, and creatine, and the vast amount of data in humans and incredible data in animal models with taurine improving longevity and overall health outcomes. It doesn't make sense to me that a food like red meat, so full of nutrients that are so bioavailable for humans, would worsen your longevity prospectus when it is full of unique nutrients that you cannot find in plant foods that clearly improve your longevity. This is silly to me. I think that a lot of the longevity conversations are well-intentioned, but misguided. So enjoy this podcast on meat and longevity. I was recently in Austin and got a special request for this podcast. So I thought it's a great idea. That's what I'll do. And that's what's coming at you this week. Many of you know that I recently spent some time in Greece researching Mediterranean diets and longevity. So it's probably apropos that on the way back from that trip, I stopped in Los Angeles to promote a smoothie with Erewhon and then in Austin, Texas. And while I was in Austin, Texas, I met someone at a gym and said, what do you think I could do better with the work? This woman approached me and said, hey, thanks for your work. Appreciate what you do. And I said, oh, that's cool. What could I do better? And she said, oh, I'd love to see a podcast on longevity, meat and longevity. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. I know there's a lot of discussion these days about longevity. And there's a lot of argument that a plant-based diet is better for longevity. Something I've discussed in two podcasts in the last year, one about meat and longevity and one about debunking vegan arguments. We can put the links to those below in the YouTube video or on the screen in the YouTube video if you guys want to listen to previous podcasts or they're in the Spotify or Apple podcast, wherever you want to listen to them, the previous podcasts on meat and longevity and debunking vegan arguments, which generally have to do with longevity. But I thought that based on some new research that I've been doing regarding nutrients, there's another angle that I could take in this discussion of meat and longevity that I wanted to share with you guys. So I'll do that today. And as part of this podcast to celebrate the beginning of the podcast. I'm going to eat some raw liver and uh, goat's milk to wash it down. Hold on. Okay. This is my celebration of the beneficial qualities. Of meat and organs and raw goat's milk. And in this podcast, I'll make an argument that there are many unique nutrients contained essentially only in meat and organs, not in plant foods, that have been shown to be beneficial for humans at multiple levels, including directly implicated in improving longevity, but also lean body mass, skeletal mass, bone mass, recovery, glucose tolerance, dementia, cognitive function, sexual health. And when you have nutrients that do all of these things for humans, we can clearly say they're contributing to human health and then therefore human longevity because of that health span as we move forward. Interestingly, while I was in Los Angeles, I sent an email to Brian Johnson, B-R-Y-A-N Johnson, not Brian Johnson, Liver King, and asked if he would be willing to do a podcast with me while I was there. He politely declined and said that he was not interested in tribalism, which I think is fair. I definitely put in that email that I would be respectfully um, having some discussion with him about our differing views on how to achieve longevity and length of life and length of health span. Uh, hopefully, Brian and I will be able to connect at some point in the future. I offered that he and I could just hang out at Muscle Beach, original Muscle Beach, not regular Muscle Beach, original Muscle Beach. That's the cool one in Los Angeles. So, and he seemed excited about that. We just couldn't make the schedules work. And he seemed like a very lovely guy, at least via email. And so I just want to note all of that as context for this podcast, because in this podcast, I will mention some of the things he's doing, and I will give some criticism of those in the most respectful way. And it's not meant to be a personal attack or anything like that. I just disagree with many of the findings that he and his team have reached with regard to how to live, how to supplement, and how to eat for longevity. So that is the context of the Brian Johnson experience in Los Angeles. And I think that a lot of the conversations right now are perhaps driven by what he's doing. He's certainly spending a lot of money. And I think it's kind of frustrating in some ways that, that he's he and his team are arriving at different conclusions than I believe are true. But I think these are the conclusions that most of the mainstream scientific community is arriving at. And in this podcast, we'll talk about why I think those things are wrong. So 
that is the lead in to this podcast. And if you're watching on YouTube, I'll do some screen shares throughout the podcast as I often do. Wanted to start with the overarching framework of why we think red meat is bad for longevity in the first place. Why we think eating meat is not good for longevity or red meat is not a food for longevity in the first place. And this is generally based on many articles like this one. This is a Harvard Health study, and this is a sort of editorial of it from June 1st, 2012, but this is essentially representative of the mainstream view. This is summarizing data in an epidemiology study, so an observational study, including 84,000 women from the Nurses Health Study. It was published April 6th in the Archives of Internal Medicine. And Frank Hugh, who's one of the investigators at Harvard, he's part of this epidemiology school there, the professor of nutrition at, public, at Harvard School of Public Health, uh, Frank Hugh, Walter Willett, these are often names that come up in this epidemiology space, and often their ideas are things that I disagree with. But his direct quote in this article is that this study provides clear evidence that regular consumption of red meat, especially processed meat, contributes substantially to premature death. And that's a bold claim, in my opinion, perhaps my belief, very strong opinion, when you're talking about an epidemiology study. I don't think any observational study ever provides us clear evidence that consumption or the action that is being described in that epidemiology study is connected with anything. <laughs> it tells us an association, but correlation is not causation. And so this is the main problem that happens in the meat and longevity space. And I think this is probably the, the mistake that Brian Johnson and his team are making. Again, this is respectful discussion of their choices. It's not meant to be direct criticism, but I do wish that he'd been willing to have direct conversation about this. That if you look at epidemiology, there are certainly observational studies which suggest that the consumption of meat is associated with worse outcomes in terms of health and longevity. Now, the problem with these studies is, is it possible that people who are eating more red meat in these studies are also doing more unhealthy behaviors? And any epidemiologist will admit that that is definitely a distinct possibility. The problem lies when physicians, professors of nutrition at Harvard School of Public Health, like Frank Hugh, say, this study provides clear evidence that regular consumption of red meat contributes substantially to premature death. That is an absolute falsehood. And what is being left out of this discussion, at least at the very surface level, is the fact that there are many epidemiology studies, which are, again, observational, which do not show any association between red meat consumption and premature death or worsening of cardiovascular disease or other health outcomes, nor do they show improvements or benefits with vegetarian diets. So at the beginning of the podcast, I'll show some of that contradictory research that often gets left out. What is often also not discussed, and if you look at this actual study from Harvard published in 2012 in the Archives of Internal Medicine, is the demographics of the people who eat more meat. And as I suggested, is it possible they're less healthy? And absolutely, yes, they are. If you look at the demographics in the epidemiology study, people that eat more red meat in that study, which Frank Hugh says clearly demonstrates that red meat causes premature death, these people are less healthy. They're more obese, they exercise less, they have more disease, they smoke more, they drink more alcohol, et cetera. So this is the problem with many of these studies that are epidemiology. They do not show us that red meat causes anything. And there's a little caveat in there, of course, because he says, especially processed meat, but all too often, unprocessed red meat, that is hamburger, that is steak, that gets lumped in with processed red meat, things like cold cuts from the deli or hot dogs or sausages. And as many of you will know, when you process a red meat, there can be some funny business in there. Whether it's a preservative, many of the deli cuts contain carrageenan, a sulfated polysaccharide that I've spoken about in the past that is known to be irritating, at least in animal models, to the gut and looks to be pretty harmful for humans. We don't really want these emulsifiers in there. There can be dyes. These meats are highly processed. They're probably taken from less quality animals. These are not the same as a ground beef that you get from your butcher. I went to the butcher here today, got a pound, two pounds of grass-fed ground beef. That, in my opinion, is a health food and that's what I'll be talking about in this podcast because that red meat contains unique nutrients that are not found in plant foods. And if you look at those nutrients, there is, I would say, unequivocal evidence that those nutrients are essential for optimal human health and in so many ways contribute to things that improve longevity. So anyone suggesting that red meat is bad for longevity really, I think, is misunderstanding the research. Again, direct discussion regarding these issues, I think, is the key to moving these ideas forward. 
And though I believe there is some degree of tribalism here, I think that if people on the other side of these issues are unwilling to have these discussions, it's very difficult to advance the conversation. Be that as it may, I'm doing this podcast regardless. As I mentioned, there are multiple epidemiology studies that show that there is essentially no benefit to avoiding meat in the human diet. This is one titled Mortality in Vegetarians. So if you look at the conclusions of this paper, they state clearly United Kingdom-based vegetarians and non-vegetarians, those eating meat, omnivores, have similar all-cause mortality. Okay, that's just one example of a study that often gets left out of the conversation. Here's another one. Vegetarian diet and all-cause mortality, evidence from a large population-based Australian cohort, the 45 and up study. You can see here, they say that there were 243,096 participants aged 62.3 years, 46.7% men. That was the mean age, 62.3 years. And they say that there was no significant difference in mortality risk between pesco-vegetarians or semi-vegetarians versus regular meat eaters. We found no evidence that following a vegetarian diet, semi-vegetarian diet, or pesco-vegetarian diet has an independent protective effect on all-cause mortality. So again, just an example of epidemiology that often gets left out of this conversation when people make blanket statements suggesting things like meat is associated with worse outcomes. And last but not least, there is a large study from Asia showing similar results. Meat intake and cause-specific mortality, a pooled analysis of Asian prospective cohort studies. This one is also over 200,000 participants, and they say ecological data indicates an increase in meat intake in Asians. However, our pooled analysis did not provide evidence of a higher risk of mortality for total meat intake and provided evidence of an inverse association with red meat, poultry, and fish slash seafood. Red meat intake was inversely associated with CVD mortality in men, that's cardiovascular disease mortality in men, and with cancer mortality in women. So again, the epidemiology literature is often misrepresented and oversimplified when we're talking about meat and longevity. The point of that is just to show you all that there are epidemiology studies which do not show any association between red meat consumption and premature death. The Harvard study is unfortunate, especially in the fact that Frank Hugh is representing the results, or I would say over-representing those results. But again, this is the way that mainstream media slash Harvard often wants to publicize these things. They sort of want to make it seem like the case is shut on this perspective when it's actually quite complex and very different than what most people believe. So with that in mind, let's think about red meat or meat in general, whether it's from birds or pigs, wild pigs. When I was with the Hadza in Tanzania, the thing that they wanted as much as anything else was to get a big game kill. A large antelope would have been amazing. They killed a baboon while I was there and we shared the meat in the camp. But these hunters want red meat. They will eat white meat, they'll eat little birds, but they want red meat. They essentially want meat from animals that have more iron in their muscles. They want ruminant meat also if they can get it, like an impala or an antelope. So this is clearly a food that has been a center of the human diet for hundreds of thousands of years. Intuitively, we can ask this question, and of course we'll try and support it with science. Why would this food be bad for us? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense for it to be bad for us when it's something that has really inarguably been at the center of our diet for so very long. And when you look at the unique nutrients in red meat, I think this is a very clarifying point to move forward in your thinking about red meat and human health. And red meat is of course the meat that is most vilified. Now, again, we're talking about unprocessed red meat. I'm not a huge fan of processed meat, but we must not conflate those two things. So what nutrients are present in red meat that are uniquely present in red meat? And in fact, there have been multiple papers written about this. There are amino acids like taurine and 4-hydroxyproline. There are dipeptides like anserine and carnosine. There is the substance creatine, which we know is beneficial for humans in so many ways, perhaps the single most studied ergogenic aid for humans. And there are other vitamins and minerals which are uniquely found in animal foods, things like B12 and vitamin K2. Some may argue that K2 is found in plant foods like natto, but technically speaking, it's the bacteria that are fermenting those soybeans that are making the K2 not in the soybeans itself. So there's really no menaquinone or any type of menaquinone 
found in plant foods, and there are clear cardiovascular benefits to menaquinone. So in this podcast, I will go through uh, one article, which is a great job of summarizing those nutrients, talk about the benefits of those nutrients, how much of those nutrients you want. But my premise, the argument that I would advance in this podcast is that if there are this many <laughs> nutrients that are found only in red meat that are essential for human health, optimal human health, how can red meat possibly be bad for longevity? And similarly, if your longevity protocol, which is based on a vegan diet, like many longevity quote experts today, including Brian Johnson and his teams, needs to have over a hundred supplements to in any way, shape or form, begin to recreate the vast, incredible nutrient panoply found in red meat, you're probably doing something wrong. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. If you don't believe me, I will show you a list of the supplements that Brian Johnson uses. He's publicly said he takes over a hundred supplements a day. Many of these are things that are found in abundance in animal foods. He takes a B-complex pill. Now, let's just talk about this. Thymine, present in pork, probably present in meat of any type, just misrepresented in the FDA database. You've got folate in liver, riboflavin exclusively found in significant amounts in liver and heart, not so much in muscle meat. Vitamin B6, well represented in meat. Vitamin B12 is something we've talked about. So if you're eating meat, you don't need a B complex. Vitamin C, okay, that one's found in fruit. Now, CoQ10, that's clearly beneficial for longevity. That's found in heart, muscle meat from animals. Vitamin E, that's found in animal fat. This is something that's very often misunderstood, but bioavailable vitamin E, found in butter, found in tallow. EPA, acosapentaenoic acid, that's found in animal foods. Iodine, that's found in animal foods. He's taking vitamin K2 in the MK4 configuration of metaquinone. That's found in animal foods. He's taking MK7, also present in animal foods. Lithium, you can find that in your water or sometimes in animal foods as well. Look, he's taking two grams of taurine per day, a nutrient that is found only in animal foods. Zinc, very widely found in animal foods and very bioavailable. Calcium alpha ketoglutarate, found in animal foods. More taurine, tyrosine, and amino acid found in animal foods. And so it's interesting to me that in what is perhaps the most widely publicized or well-known version of someone spending millions of dollars to improve their longevity, they're, number one, taking multiple supplements, hundred over 100 supplements, many of which are found in animal foods, but yet insists on a vegan diet. Again, this is what his team has decided, and I'd love to have some discussion with them about why they've made that decision. And number two, it's clear that he's also left out many things which are important and clearly shown to be beneficial that are still in animal foods. Things I mentioned earlier, things like carnosine, things like anserine, things like creatine, which I'm very surprised to see him not taking. Things like 4-hydroxyproline, he's not taking an animal-based collagen. So, so many beneficial things that he's leaving out and things that are clearly present in animal foods must be supplemented. So if you believe your vegan diet is better for longevity, but in order to get optimal, you must take multiple supplements, many supplements, to make up for the nutrient deficiencies in your vegan diet, and there is correspondingly a simple, easy, elegant, evolutionarily consistent solution to getting those nutrients, namely eating meat and organs that you've left out of your vegan diet, I think we must begin to ask about the sanity of vegan diets in general. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Furthermore, and this isn't something I'll discuss in this podcast, but something I will discuss in the future, if you want to gain muscle on a vegan diet, and in order to do that, you must take significant hundreds of grams of synthetic processed vegan protein powders made from pea protein or hemp protein isolate, getting proteins or amino acids in concentration that would be very difficult to get from whole foods, you must also question the sanity of a vegan diet for long-term health, long-term longevity, long-term bone density and muscle growth. It doesn't seem to add up, guys. And the story regarding vegan diets and longevity, it, it falls apart when you examine it scientifically but especially this nutrient conversation is interesting. So let's begin talking about the specific nutrients found really only in meat in general and how beneficial they are for humans. And hopefully by the end of the podcast, you will be even more hungry for that steak or that burger you want to eat with some liver or some desiccated organs or some source of organs because those are providing these unique nutrients. And I think it's important for us to understand that as humans, when we're eating these foods, red meat is not just protein. Red meat is 
taurine and creatine and vitamin K2 and vitamin B12 and vitamin B6. There are so many unique things in there. And this is why I'm always a fan of eating whole foods above anything. So if you want a really good summary article for all of this, this is probably it, published in the journal Amino Acids in 2020. Hopefully I'll be able to get this researcher on my podcast and have a formal conversation with him. But the title is Important Roles of Dietary Taurine, Creatine, Carnosine, Answerine, and 4-Hydroxyproline in Human Nutritional Health. In the abstract, the author clearly states these five nutrients are highly abundant in beef, have important physiologic roles in antioxidative, anti-inflammatory reactions, as well as neurological, muscular, retinal, immunological, and cardiovascular function. Of particular note, taurine, carnosine, anserine, and creatine are absent from plants, and 4-hydroxyproline is negligible in many plant source foods. That is a pretty profound statement there. Neurological, muscular, retinal, immunological, and cardiovascular function with these four to five nutrients being essential, found abundantly in beef, not in plant foods. But red meat is bad for you and red meat will shorten your life. Of course, the elephant in the room in this whole red meat conversation is the saturated fat raising your cholesterol conversation and then increased cardiovascular disease outcomes with cholesterol. I have spoken about cholesterol on the podcast multiple times. Finally, got cardiologists to agree to come on the podcast. We'll have some friendly discussion slash debate in the next couple of weeks about this. So stay tuned. So in this podcast, I won't be going into saturated fat from animal foods and the, I would say, misinformed notion that when you eat red meat and your LDL goes up, that's a bad thing because I'll be talking about LDL, ApoB, and the essentially making the argument that there is not solid evidence to show that ApoB is directly injurious to the endothelium in an upcoming podcast. In this podcast, I wanted to focus on these nutrients and why they're so important. They often get left out. People don't think about them. They don't supplement them. And they have clear benefits in humans. At least Brian is getting taurine in his diet. But as I said earlier, he's missing carnosine, anserine, creatine, and hydroxyproline. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg. So interestingly, as this article states, the fear regarding beef in the United States has caused a decline in this health food from 95 pounds in 1976 to 60 pounds in 2017. And yes, I would consider red meat to be one of the single greatest health foods in our human diet. And so the fact that we're eating less of it is bad. And if you look at other podcasts I've done, you'll understand that we're also eating more of other things. We're eating more grains and we're eating more seed oils. What's happening to our health, guys? It's going in the wrong direction. So there are many explanations, many hypotheses for what could be contributing to that. But at least in terms of food arguments, it's very difficult to make the argument that red meat is causing problems for humans when we're eating less of it in our diet overall and we're getting less healthy. Again, we're just talking in potentialities here and correlations. But the only correlation we find right now is that as we eat less red meat as humans, we become less healthy. Next vegan, now thriving. Check out this review on beef organs from Heart and Soil Supplements. Recent ex-vegan here, ever since combining Dr. Paul's animal-based diet and trying beef organs from Heart and Soil Supplements, I feel like a brand new human being. The supplements definitely have a noticeable positive effect on my mood and overall feeling of well-being. If I feel sluggish at all, I take some organ supplements and I feel refreshed for the day. I can't wait to try other heart and soil supplements, honestly. Thank you, Dr. Paul, for preaching this healthy lifestyle. It's seriously been life-changing in the best way. Tiffany, thank you for the review. You're welcome. I'm so glad to hear stories like this. I was recently in Los Angeles for the launch of the animal-based smoothie with Erewhon, and I heard so many people, hundreds of people came out to tell me their stories. A lot of ex-vegans in there feeling better on organs. A lot of them use things including beef organs from Heart and Soil Supplements to start back to including animal foods in their diet with significant improvements. It's awesome to hear. You can find all of our supplements from Heart and Soil at heartandsoil.co, that's .co. All of our supplements are grass-fed, grass-finished, regeneratively raised, the finest organ supplements on the planet, always in glass because plastic is bullshit. Who needs more of that in the world? It doesn't get recycled anyway, it just ends up in some landfill. We don't wanna to contribute to that anyway. So heartandsoil.co. And back to the podcast. It's also important to note that vegans and vegetarians have repeatedly been shown to be deficient or have significantly lower levels 
of all of these nutrients in their bodies. Some of these can be made partially by the human body, but if you really look at the biochemistry in our human form as Homo sapiens, it's pretty clear that we don't make nearly enough of any of these things and that getting them in our diet is very beneficial for humans. So not getting them in your diet as a vegan or vegetarian leads to deficiency and suboptimal levels. Again, not great for longevity. So let's start with taurine. Taurine is used to conjugate bile acids to form bile salts in the liver. This facilitates intestinal absorption of dietary lipids, including lipid-soluble vitamins, and eliminates cholesterol in the bile via the fecal root. Taurine is a major antioxidant. It's anti-inflammatory. It's anti-apoptotic or apoptotic. People say apoptosis, apoptosis, however you want to say it. It means programmed cell death factor in the human body. Taurine is a physiologic stabilizer of cell membranes. It's a regulator of modulation of calcium signaling, fluid homeostasis in cells, retinal photoreceptor activity. It's a contributor to osmoregulation, which is the regulation of osmolites or essentially electrolytes in the human body, a key component of nerve and muscle conduction networks, a stimulator of neurological development, an inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. The benefits of taurine are vast. It protects cells and tissues from the toxicity of reactive oxygen species, excess metals like nickel and manganese, ammonia. It's, it's so valuable for humans. It's an incredible thing for us. And again, only found in animal foods. Ingestion of 0.4 to 6 grams of taurine per day improved metabolic profiles in the blood, including reductions in total cholesterol, low-density cholesterol, whether we believe those are good or bad, cardiovascular functions in healthy subjects, as well as in patients with overweight, diabetes, hypertension, or congestive heart failure. Oral administration of two grams of taurine per day for four weeks resulted in clinically significant reductions in the frequency, duration, and intensity of muscle cramps in patients with chronic liver disease. Long-term oral administration of taurine for 52 weeks effectively reduced the recurrence of stroke-like episodes in mitochondrial myopathy, encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes, which is known as the MELAS syndrome, a rare genetic disorder. So while we're singing the praises of taurine, I think it's important to show this study, which was recently published in the Journal of Science, one of the most well-respected journals in the world. The title of the study is Taurine Deficiency as a Driver of Aging. And coming across this study was probably one of the most important driving factors for me to do this podcast, thinking, okay, here's clearly a study showing that in animal models across species, supplementing with taurine improves aging. This is a nutrient found only in animal foods. How can animal foods be bad for longevity? It doesn't make any sense, right? So you can see here in the abstract, they say blood concentrations of taurine decline with age in mice, monkeys, and humans to investigate whether this decline contributes with aging. We orally fed taurine or a control solution once daily to middle-aged wild type female and male mice. Taurine fed mice of both sexes survived longer than the control mice. The conclusions here, taurine abundance decreases during aging. A reversal of this decline through taurine supplementation increases health span and lifespan in mice and worms and health span in monkeys. So primate, very similar to humans. Now, we need more studies on taurine in humans, but if we go back to the first article that I mentioned, there are a lot of studies that have already been done in humans. So I will screen share this. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see all this, or if you're listening to the podcast, you'll be able to get that reference and find this. But look at these studies in humans with taurine supplementation. So 1.5 to 2.5 grams per day for 12 weeks in children with abnormalities of the retina, improved retinal health, 0.4 grams to 1.6 grams per day for two weeks in healthy adults, improved cardiovascular health by decreasing platelet aggregation and thromboxane release from platelets. When platelets release thromboxane, they're sort of becoming activated in more hypercoagulable state. So that's a benefit in terms of coagulability. 1.5 grams per day for 90 days in patients with insulin-dependent diabetes improved platelet taurine levels and decreased platelet aggregation. Again, this is going to decrease the coagulability, the stickiness of the blood. And I should say that it's very easy to get 1.5 grams of taurine per day from meat, especially if you are eating medium rare steaks. One of the things I came across in my research on taurine is that taurine is degraded 50 to 60% by cooking. So 
here's a reason not to eat your steak well done or eat your hamburger well done. Heart is very rich in taurine. I think chicken gizzards might be one of the richest sources of taurine. This is essentially for dog food. I don't think you'd want to eat raw chicken gizzards, but there are some really, really rich sources of taurine in our environment and getting animal foods in your diet will give you probably close to half a gram or gram of taurine a day easily, especially if you're eating them mid-rare or even rare. Three grams per day for seven weeks, overweight and obese adults, decreases in body weight, plasma triglycerides, atherogenic index. Three grams per day for 60 days, improved blood pressure in patients with mild or borderline hypertension. Three grams per day for 30 to 45 days, um, decreased in left ventricular diastolic volume and increase in the serum creatinine in patients with heart failure. Uh, decreasing left ventricular and diastolic volume is a metric that tells us how dilated the heart is when it is relaxing, and that's an improvement in cardiovascular disease. Increasing serum creatinine is not necessarily a bad thing. As you'll see when I discuss creatine, getting more creatine from meat in your diet will increase your serum creatinine, but it's not an indication of declining kidney function. It's just an indication that you have more of the breakdown products of creatine in your diet. Notably, for those of you who may be eating significant amounts of meat in your diet every day, if you go to get a kidney test, a comprehensive metabolic panel, and your creatinine is quote unquote elevated or borderline elevated, ask your doctor to get a cystatin C, which is a metric of kidney function as well that is not dependent on the amount of creatine in your diet. Those of us who are particularly muscular or eating significant amounts of creatine, whether by supplementation or meat, may see bumps in serum creatinine that don't reflect any decline in kidney function. So I won't go through every single study here. There's about six more of similar doses, one to six grams a day. And the improvements are, again, decreasing blood pressure, muscle cramps, decreased stroke-like episodes, improvement in endurance for cardiovascular performance, improvement in cardiovascular function, cardiac function in patients with CHF. And the results with taurine are, are striking. The other research done by the group looking at mice and primates and worms in terms of life extension with taurine is also particularly compelling. So taurine is just the first thing to talk about here. Again, it's taurus. <laughs> it's bull. <laughs> this isn't found in spinach. <laughs> this is found in meat. So if you want to have benefits of taurine in your diet, which are profound, getting red meat in your diet is a good thing. I'll pause at this moment and talk about how much red meat. My website is paulsaladinomd.co.co. There's an animal-based calculator there where you can figure out sort of a ballpark of what I might recommend in terms of meat consumption on an animal-based diet. For anyone who's not familiar, an animal-based diet is a framework that I developed over my years, coming from a carnivore diet, kind of a mixture of a carnivore diet and a paleo diet without vegetables. It's meat, it's organs, either fresh or desiccated, like we make it hard in soil supplements, with fruit, honey, and raw dairy. And I think of this as a simple way to get nutrients while also consuming the least amount of plant toxins. There's a calculator, again, at paulsaladinomd.co if you want to look at how I might suggest you make your macros for protein, carbohydrates, and fat how much meat you should eat. The baseline there is one gram of protein per pound of lean body weight or goal body weight. And one pound of meat contains about 100 grams of protein. Again, this is bioavailable protein, significantly more bioavailable than plant proteins. So if you are 150 pounds, I probably would recommend about 150 grams of protein per day. You don't have to get all of that from meat. You can get some of that from things like raw milk if you want to do dairy Listen to last week's podcast if you want to know my thoughts on raw dairy. I went out to Raw Farm, the largest raw dairy in the world. Got to sit down with Mark McAfee and learned a ton about raw milk. I got to see it all being produced. We're making a whole YouTube about how the raw milk there is made, so stay tuned for that as well. So if you're interested in starting an animal-based diet, Heart and Soil and I are collaborating for the Animal-Based 30, which is a free 30-day challenge eating an animal-based diet. You can go to animal based 30 it's one word, animalbased30.com to sign up. It's free. There are a ton of resources there. There's community, there's forums, all sorts of things to help you in your animal-based journey to get started on this way of eating. It's not easy to change the way you eat, but over and over, when I was in Los Angeles recently for the Erewhon smoothie launch, I saw literally hundreds of people that came out to tell me their stories. And it was, it was incredible. It was overwhelming. This way of eating is definitely helping people. I don't believe it's the only way of eating that people need to do to be healthy, but I think that it's something that is profoundly powerful. 
yes, you might be able to eat some vegetables from time to time. Not everybody can, is going to be as sensitive as me or other people to certain vegetables. Maybe you can even eat some broccoli, of course, no problem. But the idea is understanding which foods contain the most nutrients and the least amount of plant toxins, and that's an animal-based diet. And the interesting thing about all of this for me is that an animal-based diet is really based around meat. It's based around animal foods. It doesn't have to be red meat, though I think that red meat is probably the best source of these things because it's the cleanest meat out there, especially if you're getting it grass-fed and grass-finished. You're thinking about chicken, you're thinking about pork. These foods are predominantly fed corn and soy, evolutionarily inconsistent things for these animals to be eating, which increases the amount of linoleic acid, this 18-carbon polyunsaturated omega-6 fatty acid in their fat, which I don't think is a great thing for humans. They're not impossible to eat. They're just not the best thing in my opinion. I'm not a huge fan of fish, but you can eat it sometimes if you want. Just check your heavy metals. Fish is generally today contaminated with arsenic, mercury, lead, cadmium, PFAS, so parafluoroalkyl substances, microplastics, et cetera. So I'm not as much a fan of those foods. You can eat them on an animal-based diet. They certainly don't contain defense chemicals like a lot of vegetables do, but I think that in general, they're just not as exciting. But I think that in general, they're just not as great for humans as grass-fed, grass-finished red meat. And what I'm talking about this podcast is the unique nutrients found in beef. And when that meat is at the center of your diet and people are saying it's not good for longevity, it's important to address these things. Incidentally, and again, this is more foreshadowing with regard to upcoming podcasts on LDL and cholesterol, ApoB, cardiovascular disease, for many of us, including myself, when we eat more saturated fat from animal foods, ground beef, butter, cheese, tallow, things like this, and less or zero seed oils, our LDL will go up. My LDL, if you listen to my previous blood work podcasts, which are all in my podcast, is now between 140 and 160 milligrams per deciliter. So it's gone up maybe 20, 30%. But I don't think this is any increase in my cardiovascular risk. And this is what I want to help people understand, share my ideas with this, and formally directly debate a cardiologist who, many cardiologists, hopefully, who believe that ApoB is directly injurious to the endothelium. Again, that's foreshadowing of what's to come in the future. So returning to this nutrient list, let's talk about creatine. I think that at this point, basically no one will argue that creatine is beneficial for humans and is perhaps the single most studied ergogenic aid for humans ever. And it occurs only in meat. The human body can make a small amount of it, but we only make about 1.7 grams per day. And that probably only makes up for the amount of creatine that we're wasting every day by doing more exertion. So if I'm surfing or skating, I'm going to use up more creatine per day and I need more in my diet. How much is ideal? I think three to five grams per day for most humans is ideal. And if you're doing that much or anywhere near that, over the course of a few months, you will saturate your muscles with creatine and that leads to optimal function of your muscles, optimal muscle strength, improvements in recovery, and improvements in mental function as well with creatine because it's this energy currency in the human body. In the same study I mentioned earlier, they do show some of the studies with creatine. They're really too many to note. You have 20 grams of creatine for six days, improved muscular strength, reduced intensive exercise associated muscle damage, four grams of creatine per day for six weeks, enhanced anaerobic power and strength, similar doses, enhanced sprint cycling performance. I mean, the data here is, is vast and really unequivocal improved antioxidant capacity, exercise performance and recovery, improved neurological and muscular function with three grams of creatine per day for weeks or months, three grams. A pound of meat generally contains 1.5 to two grams of creatine. Uh, one liter of milk contains about one gram of creatine. So I'm probably getting about 1.5 pounds of meat per day in my diet plus one liter of milk. So I bet that I'm getting between three and four grams of creatine per day in my diet which is probably fine for me since I've been doing it for so long. I believe my muscles are pretty saturated. But many people listening to this are not getting nearly enough creatine and doing nothing else. Even if you take a creatine monohydrate or a creatine phosphate supplement, provided that it's a good supplement and that it's clean and you look at certificate of analysis, you're going to improve your performance. But the argument here is, again, this is found exclusively in meat. And clearly, muscle strength, lean body mass, recovery, resilience, avoidance of sarcopenia, neurological, muscular function, immunologic function, cognitive function, these are all highly associated with longevity. It makes absolutely no sense to argue that red meat is bad for longevity when there are so many nutrients like this that are so beneficial found only in red meat. To really drive this point home, I'll show this 
review from 2011. The title is Use of Creatine in the Elderly and Evidence for Effects on Cognitive Function in Young and Old. Those of you in college, those of you in medical school, those of you with parents or grandparents, why are you not supplementing with creatine? Why are you not having your parents supplement with creatine? Or why are you not including more red meat in your diet? So the ingestion of dietary supplemental creatine, 20 grams per day for five days or two grams per day for 30 days results in increased skeletal muscle creatine phosphocreatine. Again, two grams of creatine is found in one pound of meat. The summary of this says, creatine is an inexpensive and safe dietary supplement that has both peripheral and central effects, central being neural, neurological, peripheral being muscular, musculoskeletal. The benefits afforded to older adults through creatine ingestion are substantial, can improve the quality of life, ultimately may reduce the disease burden associated with sarcopenia and cognitive dysfunction. Sarcopenia is essentially being skinny fat, not having enough lean muscle mass. Now, those things are all going to absolutely improve longevity. And again, creatine, zero in plant foods, absolutely zero. So to all the vegans and vegetarians out there, if you're not supplementing with nutrients that are found exclusively in meat, your vegan diet is highly inferior, highly inferior. And I think the easiest way is just to eat some meat. Moving on, let's talk about carnosine. Again, same study, only found in meat, 116 milligrams per day for eight weeks. Pastrix, patients with gastric ulcers, enhanced gastric healing. So carnosine, 116 milligrams a day, enhanced gastric healing in gastric ulcer patients. Did your gastroenterologist tell you about that? If you look at articles analyzing the amount of taurine, carnosine, coenzyme Q10, creatine in meat, beef, and lamb, you can find articles like this, which suggest that in 100 grams of beef cheek, beef heart, beef liver, or semitendinosus muscle, you have between 42 and 452 <laughs> milligrams of carnosine. Up here, you see the taurine milligrams. Cheek muscle is 382. Heart is 22. Liver is 45. Semitendinosus is 36 milligrams per 100 grams. So if you're eating half a kilogram, which is about a pound or more than half a kilogram, you're getting hundreds of milligrams of taurine, of carnosine in your diet every day, just from eating animal foods. And again, this is just to say that many of the doses here that have been studied in these clinical models of humans are easily obtainable from eating animal foods. 1.5 grams per day, patients with Parkinson's disease, of carnosine, improved neurological function. Two grams per day for three months, improved neurological function in patients with schizophrenia. 0.8 grams per day for eight weeks in patients with autism, improved behavior as well as social and communication skills. That's particularly striking. One gram per day for 12 weeks. Patients with type 2 diabetes improve metabolic profiles, decrease protein glycosylation and body fat. Two grams per day for 12 weeks. Improved metabolic profiles, increase lean tissue mass in the human body. 0.5 grams, that's 500 milligrams or two grams per day for up to six months. Patients with heart failure, enhanced cardiac output and improve the quality of life. So these are not 10x what you would find in a daily dose of food. These are not 100x the amount of carnosine, creatine, or taurine that you'd find in animal foods. These are reasonably attainable doses. Some of them are slightly higher than you might get if you were eating a pound and a half or even two pounds of beef per day. But from various sources, there are different concentrations. I mean, the semitendinosus muscle of beef has a lot of carnosine in it. And so if you're eating different cuts of animals, if you're eating organs, if you're eating the heart, you're going to get significant amounts of these things in food, which is very likely more bioavailable. Again, the improvements in human trials with these compounds that are found only in meat are astounding. Let's go on to answerine, yet another one of these compounds. 10 or 100 milligrams per 45 kilograms of body weight, reduced glucose concentrations in the blood, Anserine and carnosine mix in elderly subjects, maintained adequate blood flow to the brain, preserved verbal episodic memory, and improved resting state network connectivity. A lot of these are actual anserine and carnosine mixes, which are fine because, well, you're going to get those together in foods. 
improvement in elderly subjects functioning alternate cognitive impairment, inhibit the production of inflammatory cytokines, enhance muscular strength and exercise performance, ameliorate stress, enhance physiological strength, improved metabolic profiles, immunity, neurological function, wound healing, and promotes lactation in females. That's interesting. Also, I don't know if I mentioned this last week in the podcast that I did with Mark McAfee at Raw Farm, there are multiple anecdotes of women drinking raw cow's milk and improving milk lactation. So this is fascinating to me. And I talked about this a lot on the podcast with Mark, one of my favorites that I've ever done last week, this cross-species benefits of raw true milk. Now, the last one that I talked about was 4-hydroxyproline at least in this study. This is one of the amino acids found in collagen. So proline, hydroxyproline, glycine are the main amino acids in collagen. And you're going to get this if you're eating tendons, if you're eating any bone broth, if you're eating a hydrolyzed collagen supplement. Again, these are animal foods that are going to make you die sooner, but 2.5 or 5 grams of collagen hydrolysate for eight weeks in adult women, improved skin elasticity. I mean, the results are clear here. Improvement moisture content in the epidermis, improve collagen density in the dermis and the structure of collagen network, improve facial skin conditions, improve mineral density in bones, uh, mitigated osteoporosis, 10 grams of collagen hydrolysate in women for 24 weeks in postmenopausal women. So if you read this article, I think you will be astounded at the benefits of these nutrients. And I haven't even talked about B12 or K2 yet and so many others, but you get the idea here, guys. There are unique nutrients found in animal foods, specifically red meat, tendons, that are beneficial for humans and have been studied in longevity across mice, worms, and monkeys. We haven't studied taurine in humans, but all of those species make me highly uh, confident that it will improve longevity in humans. And you see people who are doing longevity exercises, longevity trials, longevity sort of experiments using taurine they should just be eating meat, in my opinion. So if you are curious about the previous podcasts I've done and the arguments against red meat, please refer back to that stuff regarding mTOR, regarding the other compounds in meat that could be harmful for humans. Again, I've spoken about this at length in the past. I wanted to focus on the nutrients in this one and again, make this argument that if you are eating red meat, you're getting these unique nutrients and you're healthier as a, as a result of that. Red meat is a health food. So let's talk about B12. The research on B12 is particularly robust. B12 is clearly something that is not found in any plant foods anywhere in the world. I remember when the documentary Game Changers came out and they were trying to make an argument that you could get B12 from small protozoal organisms in English lakes, which was absurd. <laughs> you must eat animal foods to get B12. There's clear evidence that not getting B12 is going to cause, in some cases, irreversible damage to humans. I remember in medical school, I saw cases of humans who, in residency, cases of humans on psychiatric rotations who had significant neurologic dysfunction related to B12 deficiency that was, in some cases, reversible with B12 supplementation. The best way to get B12? Unquestionably, it's in animal foods. And there's a lot of good research regarding B12 and other B vitamin supplementation and longevity. Now, again, some of these B vitamins are able to be found in plant foods, but B12, not found in plant foods anywhere. So this is a 2018 trial. Dietary intervention modified as DNA methylation age assessed by the epigenetic clock. This is the exact type of stuff that longevity folks get really excited about. This was supplementation with folic acid and B12 along with oligomeric flavanols. So global DNA methylation levels are increased in unmethylated regions such as CPG islands and shores following folic acid plus B12 supplementation. Now, liver is a great source of folate. Egg yolks are a great source of folate. And I would say this is methylfolate or bioavailable types of folate rather than folic acid. I would never supplement a human with folic acid. That's not something that occurs in the human body. That's a conversation for other podcasts. But also depending on your MTHFR genotype, your methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase genotype, something I've talked about in the past, but my point with this study is that this is a folate analog, folic acid plus B12, improving epigenetic age, estimated by the Horvath epigenetic clock, which is something that a lot of people give a lot of credence to. That is a nutrient found in animal foods exclusively. What are we talking about <laughs> saying that red meat ages humans? That's absolutely absurd. 
the effects of long-term daily folic acid vitamin B12 supplementation on genome-wide DNA methylation in elderly subjects. This is a 2015 study. The results are the same. Long-term supplementation with folic acid and B12 in elderly subjects resulted in effects on DNA methylation in several genes, among which genes implicated in developmental processes. B vitamins, homocysteine, and neurocognitive function in the elderly. Look, the idea is if you're deficient in folic acid, which really should say folate, B12, or B6, all of which are found in animal foods, B6 and B12 being particularly abundant in animal foods, B12 being exclusively found in animal foods. They say the status of these vitamins is frequently inadequate in elderly, and recent studies have shown associations between loss of cognitive function or Alzheimer's disease and inadequate B vitamin status. Can vitamins slow down the body's aging process? This is from the Frontiers for Young Minds. It's kind of an article aimed at kids. And they say some people look younger than their age, others older. Have you ever wondered why? Humans are born with an internal biological clock within our cells, which reflects the aging state of the body. This is called the epigenetic clock. It can be changed by what we eat. In this study, we found that women who took supplements of folic acid and B12 had slower biological aging. Well, those women could also just eat meat, eat organs, eat liver, and they'll get plenty of folate, and they'll get egg yolks. All foods that are associated by the longevity community as no-nos are clearly shown to be beneficial for aging, for epigenetic and biological clocks. And there is really absolutely no debate regarding B12, dementia, neurocognitive function, neurologic function as we age. B12 found only in animal foods. Did I mention it's found only in animal foods, guys? So I think that at this point, I'll, I'll end the podcast. I'll wrap the podcast up. There's research on carnitine and acetyl L-carnitine. There's research on vitamin K2, specifically Rotterdam study, which is an observational study showing that those people who consume the most vitamin K2 found only in animal foods. There's no one in Rotterdam eating natto, I don't think. Have associated improvements in cardiovascular disease and calcific aortic sclerosis, which is narrowing of the aortic valve due to calcification. I think most people would agree that vitamin K2 is valuable for cardiovascular health. Many vegans will supplement with this. And again, it goes back to this kind of silly idea that why are we believing that meat is so bad for longevity when this is predominantly based on bad epidemiology, misinterpreted epidemiology, exclusion and ignorance toward epidemiology study that does not support that hypothesis. I would say misinterpretation of data with regard to mTOR, which I've talked about in the past, and complete ignorance toward these unique nutrients found only in meat, made in some cases in small amounts by the human body, clearly inadequate amounts that improve function. So high level takeaway for me is eat meat, eat grass-fed meat, join us for Animal Base 30 at Hardened Soil, Animal Base 30, animalbase30.com. Get about one gram of meat, predominantly grass-fed red meat, preferably grass-fed red meat, in your diet per pound of gold body weight. Don't overcook it so you get taurine. Get some organs like liver or heart so you get the new unique nutrients found in those. And don't fear red meat. It's truly a health food. And I think that these arguments that it's bad for longevity fall apart and are clearly exposed as being silly when prominent vegan, quote, longevity, quote, athletes are taking supplements that are found exclusively in meat, that are found in the foods that we should be eating. For those of you not getting enough meat, I would definitely supplement creatine at a dose of three to five grams per day. If you're getting one gram of protein from animal source foods per pound of gold body weight, you're probably getting enough creatine. A little more won't hurt, but you don't have to go overboard. For most people, I don't believe that carnosine, anserine, taurine supplementation is necessary. You could try if you want, but I don't think it's going to be significantly beneficial above what you're getting from animal foods. I do think organs are valuable, as I've said in the past, and you're going to get 4-hydroxyproline from collagen. So if you're eating predominantly muscle meat and not a tendinous meat, I would make a bone broth. I would consider a collagen hydrolysate, 4-hydroxyproline, which has clearly been studied to be beneficial for tendon strength for skin. We all want to look younger, et cetera. So that's really the high level in this podcast, guys. The idea that, look, there's research on taurine and carnosine and all these nutrients that shows it's beneficial in so many ways. 
We need more studies on longevity in humans, but I suspect they will show exactly the same thing that taurine does across all the animal models. And then the plant-based world will really look kind of silly and be forced to really reconcile this cognitive dissonance and this conundrum that how can there be so many nutrients in red meat and organs that are beneficial for humans and clearly beneficial for indices of longevity and metrics that contribute to longevity when red meat is bad for us? Doesn't make any sense to me. I already ate the liver, but I'll drink some more raw goat milk to that. Cheers. See you guys next week.